I'm just sitting here. I got time. It's clear to see from up here. The world seems small. We can sit together. It's so beautiful. You and me. Meant to be in the great outdoors, forever free. pick up some thimbleberry shortly. You got till about, I've actually picked thimbleberry leaves in November. They hang oh, in, no kidding. They well, hang in there a um, long time. So you want to, you're low on nettle, you want to ration. Try well, that's good to know. It's quite a bit weaker than that. It's good to know. I want to put lots in. Oh, yeah. Right. It's like, when I go to put it together, I show the book and the right. thing and where you go and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But basically, basically people, when they're thinking of origami, they go, what the hell? Both it, origami, what the hell? Isn't that a dress? It's the way. Dress? It's the way sheet metal work has been done since the ancient Egyptians. Really? Cut the shape to match the edges. When they said boats, so how do you build a boat? Oh, you set up frames, okay. And they just they didn't go to the sheet metal workers, they went to the wooden boat builders for how to use this stuff. Uh, you think of wood, a strength in one direction only. It comes in small sizes. You can't get 8 by 40 sheets of uh, wood. It changes everything. You can wrap, you can bend a piece of steel. I've done it. 90 degrees flat out and bend it 90 degrees the other way without breaking it. You can't do that with wood. It changes everything. You're not dealing with the same material. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the difference in the, you know, like, this business of setting up frames to get your shape, then pulling the edges to get and putting the plate on and making it fit. That's a copy of wooden boat building. It completely throws away the benefits of steel. Yeah, because the strength is in the curving, right? Strength is equal in all directions. You know, cold molded, yeah, cold molded, you have only three layers on. You have, in any one direction, you have one third the strength. The rest is all across the grade. Yeah. Steel has the same stretch in all directions, no matter how you look. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I remember when I first saw your boat. I'd come off uh, the straight. I had yeah. a 30 foot Arlberg. Yeah. And, uh, and and it was just one of those summer storms that came up. Yeah. And stays were gone. Yeah. Uh, anchor was gone. Yeah. And uh, and I saw you uh, bottomed out in there. Yeah. I don't know who you were from Adam. Yeah. So you tapped on the hull and 
And you gave me oh. some thimbleberry tea, and, and then the next thing you know, I'm building one of your books. But how, I mean, when or like why did you even get involved in sailing? Was, was it as a kid or something? Or I was delivering papers in Saskatchewan, 40 below. And I'd go to collect these houses and open the door and the smell of diapers was just about to knock you over. <laughs> <laughs> he had this fully wound up, stressed look on his face. And well, your diapers to... didn't stink. No, my didn't stink. No, my shit don't stink. <laughs> but uh, the guy was totally stressed out, wound up. You assume that's all there is. You have no other choice. I, I am not going to live this way. And how old were you? 14. 14? Yeah. Okay. And then I got to high school. I was 15 years old. I read the story Typee by Herman Melville. Right. And he was on the kid on the beach in California. His uncle came up from French Polynesia on the schooner and took him aboard. And they went for adventures all around the French Society Islands and uh, two motus, Marquesas. I thought, this is what I want to do. This is. And then I was about 15. I delivered a Star Weekly. I had an article about a couple on the BC coast. Didn't you know them? And had a little logging outfit. They built themselves a 35 footer. Oh, that would be. Um him and his wife, right? Him and his wife, and they had several kids. Yeah. Then they saved the best lumber, milled it for the boat, built themselves a boat, sold the logging outfit, threw the kids on board, and crewed in the South Pacific. In yeah. Pacific. Can be done. Yeah. Holy shit. Can be done. Wow. I'm going to do it. And, um... And I started reading everything I could in the Prince Albert Saskatoon Library about offshore cruising. A surprising amount in British magazines. I decided what I need was something around 30 feet long, outboard rudder, sloop rig, hard china is fine. And when I first come to the coast, the idea was either build a boat here or uh, go to Australia, but wage were lower, I got a good job. And the night shift, this Englishman who's a sailing fan said, Oh, here's a good deal uh, $2,500, 36 foot hull, some deck beams. Let's see that. I can buy it the next day. And you spend a couple years fitting it out, and a year on the coast, oh, it's as green as a zucchini. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, headed for the South Pacific at the ripe old age of 23. So, how did you get involved in origami? Where, what was your inspiration? Did you um, work somewhere that you saw it? Or? No, me and uh, Roy Chambers had a steel working shop in uh, Duncan. I actually did a lot on his barge. And uh, a Dutchman came out, and we started discussing various ways you can get a boat together. And uh, started talking about origami. I went to Vancouver, got enough work to take off back to Tahiti. Went through Maple Bay, and Roy Chambers was launching a 27 foot power boat, all side decks on, had a week into it. And, uh, so he, he did, this is the first origami that you saw? Or was first that I saw. And uh, 21 days later, we had the hull, the deck, the cabin, the cockpit, the keel, rudder, skeg, engine mount, lifeline, handrails, hatches, the whole works. Basic um, metal work. Like your books says that you, if you, you know, you can get a lot of the metal through the scrap yards, oh, yeah. stainless, and then, uh, and even though, um, you, you know, the average Joe can learn a little bit of welding and with some patience in your plans can put one of these boats together. But what surprised me was the number of guys who had the money to buy any kind of boat that they oh, could yeah. afford, like Dr. Miller. Miller. Mm -hmm. And uh, God, I forget the other guys' names, but they built your boats. Oh, yeah. And they could have any boat yeah. in, in, in oh, the world. Yeah. And it was, um, I think it was Steve Miller that told me that um, he was coming from New Zealand and with another family. Yeah. And what was, it, what was it? That family was in a fiberglass boat yeah. and it sunk. They, and never they were never heard from again. Yeah. Wow. He was in Fiji and he said. Oh, he uh, didn't have the steel boat at that time. Well, right? he had the fiberglass, Spencer 35. And he was in Fiji. And he said, if this boat was a foot wider and made of steel, it would be perfect. He read an article about my boats in Latitude 38. Oh, what a nice boat. So, so from 1980, what's, what is your ballpark estimate of the number of boats of yours that are sailing the water, or were built? I have A hundred, maybe? No, I have no idea. I've sent out hundreds of plans, and every time I go on the internet, there's another one that I 
I brought about 70 times two years ago. So, yeah, 150, 200. So there's a lot of books. Yeah, I've there. done. Uh, so your your design is is a proven design now. Oh, they got yeah. about 350,000 miles of open ocean. Never a serious structural problem. Right. The beach and 12 foot surf for 16 days with no serious damage. And don't forget Visky that hit the reef. Visky found it across 300 yards of Fijian coral reef. He lashed out of a tug and dragged it bouncing in big surf over 300 yards back again. The bottom looked like being sandblasted. The only dent was a slight curve in the bottom of the keel. And that boat is still sailing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> another one hit. And, you know, yeah. And you know, I think a lot of people under the misconception that the only design uh, of, of these boats is uh, a bilge keel, two keels coming on the side, but you can have it. Fin kill or a bilge kill? Oh yeah, in the 1980s, 80% 80 of my clients won single keels, so I built single keels. Now 80% of them won twin keels, and those who have single keels wish they'd gone bilge keels. And Steve Miller, he sailed against Dale DeForest in the 36 down Olympia, and they're matched on every point of sail except going to windward, and Steve thought he might have had a five percent disadvantage. Steve's got the bilge kill, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the twin kill. So yeah. The bilge kill might be 5%. Yeah. Versus the huge benefit. Well, another thing to keep in mind with twin keels is you're a hell of a lot more likely to be sitting with the clean bottom. If you've got to haul your boat up the waves or look for a grid, right, and you're more likely to sail more of your time with the dirty bottom. Right. Makes your difference. Right, right. And the other thing you have is, you know, like my boat's over three decades old. I haven't paid the tighter dock yet. Now, when I was working with someone, they may pay the bird for a bit, but uh, I never had to pay. Yeah. I've done two haul ups in 35 years. That's only because I was in Tonga and looking 4,000 miles to windward to get home. Otherwise, I wouldn't buy it. I just scraped it. Take that money, and you got all the time in the world to get where you're going. Where's the logic in that? Where's the logic in that? And also, anytime you want to tie up to the dock, um, if you don't have an expensive insurance policy yeah. on your boat, then you can't tie up to that dock. Yeah, exactly. So where does that leave the majority of people who want to go cruising? Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> you know it's between the dock and the insurance and all this stuff, you're spending more than it takes you just go cruising and get in the finger. Well, like, there's uh, a rich guy down in Comox. He said, Brent, when are you going to tie to the dock? And I said, Des, I could win $50 million in the lottery. I wouldn't pay someone to tell me what I could and couldn't do on my own boat, period. Yeah, true. Very yeah. true. They come down with a list of rules and regulations. This is what you're allowed and not allowed to do in your own home. You're not even allowed to ma maintain your own home when you're tied to the dock and paying them for this privilege. Screw that. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I guess that about does it, Brent. And, um... Part 2.